All right, this is a walkthrough of the practice test for test one. I'm also going to show you some things about the review sheet and help you uh, review uh, pr uh, study for the test. The test itself will be available at the end of the week. And once it is available, you can take it anytime you like. Uh, once you open it, you will have an hour to finish it, but there's no set time that you're supposed to have it uh, done by or a set day that you're supposed to take it. The test is open book and open note. I know in the COVID era, a lot of people are switching to modes of online testing where uh, there's a lot of surveillance and they have you have to prove that you don't have other browser windows open and you don't have your books open. You have to show an, a second camera to show your workspace and all that sort of thing. And I understand why that level of intrusiveness is important for some uh, classes and for some fields, but I really didn't feel like that level, uh, that kind of surveillance was necessary or appropriate for a philosophy class. So the test is just open, open book and open note. And uh, I encourage you, therefore, to have well-organized um, notes. Um, and the process of reading the book and taking good notes on it and um, being ready to answer questions on it that's the educational process right there, or a huge part of it. So um, if you do that, I'm confident that you will actually be, be learning. Okay, um, actually let's start by looking at the review sheet. So that is here. Um, one thing to note, let me scroll up here. Uh, for this vert copy of the review sheet, I have filled in some notes that uh, are close to what I imagine are the notes that you would take. Um, so this isn't this isn't something that I did for myself. This is this is a demonstration, right? Um, so I've got a paragraph here of uh, the things that seem significant to me for each of the characters. Notice also that there are five section headings on um, the test review sheet. Um, each of those corresponds to a pool that questions will be pulled from randomly. And it's not even, so there'll be two questions on characters, um, the people in the stories, um, three questions on housing in Milwaukee in America, sort of the political situation, Two questions again on critical thinking terms, ideas about argument. Only one question from Aristotle. And by the way, uh, I crossed out two items on this. Um, injustice as grasping slash unfairness and justice as lawfulness were both ideas that were present in the previous version of this course where I actually had you read Aristotle. But uh, this year I dropped the uh, direct Aristotle reading. So you don't have to know those. And then there are going to be two questions from Hasslinger and Young. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the practice test. So the first question is, is uh, which of the following are things that Sharina Tarver does as a landlord? Just to let you know, um, uh, the practices of the landlords is one of the things that I think is going to be really important about the characters, uh, about the landlords, right? Um, so uh, I'm asking you to keep track of uh, how the landlords run their businesses and the reasons why the character, uh, why the tenants get evicted. That's sort of the main thing I, I, um, I want you to focus on. There are other important aspects of them, um, their personalities and that sort of thing uh, that you should take notes on and I might ask questions about as well, but that's sort of secondary. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Things that Sharina Tar uh, Tarver does as a landlord. Does she allow her tenants to fall behind on rent? Yeah, she does. Um, does she make her biggest profits off of the tenants uh, of the properties that are in the worst conditions? Yeah. So um, number one, the first one I just did here is probably one that you knew off the top of your head. This one is also true as well. Um, so if we go back to this notes sheet um, 
and we can scroll down to uh, Sharina. Um, I noted here she makes most of her money off of her worst properties. Um, and uh, that's on page 76. It's good to be keeping track of what pages information is on in your notes like this. Um, and this is because the worst properties are the ones that she ha she spends the least amount of money on, but she's still making the same amount of rent. All right. Uh, she evicts tenants in retaliation for reporting building code violations. Yeah, we saw this uh, in the first chapter with the um, hole in the window. Um, and she evicted a nameless tenant for uh, uh, reporting that to uh, the, building, uh, the building commission to the city. And that's when that tenant was evicted and Arlene moved in. Does she enforce a strict no drugs policy in all her properties? No, we don't see any evidence of that whatsoever. We certainly see her tenants taking drugs. She refuses to evict people if they have very young children. No, um, we see her evicting children. And one of the things that Desmond will talk about later in the book is that in fact, having children in your family increases your likelihood of being evicted rather than decreasing it. All right. Which of the following are reasons Arlene Bell and her sons are evicted from different properties? Well, there's the story that opens the whole thing uh, where the front, uh, front door lock is broken after her son Jory throws a snowball. Um, there's also the one immediately after that in chapter one where she's uh, evicted for a building that was from a building that was declared unfit for human habitation. She does not report the hole in the window. That's another tenant. Um, she does not spend rent money on drugs. Um, we see lots of drug use, but that's not one of Arlene's issues. Fell $870 behind on rent after paying funeral costs for a close friend and have also having her welfare check sanctioned um, for missing an appointment with her caseworker. And you might not remember that. We haven't been talking about it in the videos as much. But again, you know, hopefully you've got these sorts of things in your notes. So that was discussed on page, pages 62 and 63. All right. All right, eviction court in Milwaukee. Um, the racial makeup of the tenants mirrors that of the city in general. No, actually, let's let's look over at, at, on the review sheet. I told you what things you needed to know. Here we go. Proportion of the people who are black in eviction court, 75%. That's on page 97. Proportion who are women, 75%. That's also on page 97. Um, so uh, these two here are actually directly contradicted by what's in the text. Most tenants do not have legal representation, but landlords do, and most tenants don't show up. Those two things are discussed in the text. And most of this, the, the discussion of eviction court in the part that we've read so far is in the last chapter that we read, Christmas in Room 400, where Arlene goes to uh, uh um, housing court. What proportion of uh, uh, people are evicted in Milwaukee, were evicted in Milwaukee between 2009 and 2011? Uh, the correct answer is one in eight renters. Um, and that's on page uh, five of your book. Um, so again, this is uh, information that you should just... Um, have in your notes and be able to look up. Okay. Uh, rent is the same in um, high income and low income neighborhoods. This is something that he emphasizes when he talks about sort of the, um, the model, the business model for the bottom of the market, right? Okay. So the, the, the first five questions then are all things that relate directly to Matthew Desmond's book. And you find them in there. Um, two on the, the people and three on the political situation. The next five questions.
questions are about the um, supplementary philosophical readings. So on the review sheet, here, let me show you my sample review sheet. Um, you've got the section for critical thinking terms, and I haven't filled in notes here. Um, but these are the basic ideas that I talked about in this video here. Let me scooch over. Um, it was uh, video five in week two, where we talked about the basics of argument. And so all of these terms are defined here, right? So there's the definition of an argument right there. Um, an argument is a connected series of statements designed to convince an audience of another statement. So that's what you're gonna to wanna to put in here. Um, and you might, might wanna provide some additional detail. Um, and you don't have, you can simply put in my definition or you can paraphrase it. Um, an argument is a connected series of statements designed to support another statement. And that gives you 13 words, um, so that counts. Um, and our, we might can fill in some other details here. An argument is not just disagreement um, but people can use arguments in disagreement. And with this one, actually, the two things that I'm looking for, um, the idea that an argument is composed of statements and that an argument has premises and conclusions, so some statements support others. The other thing that you're going to do in the section that has the critical thinking and argument terms in it is put an argument in standard form. And so this is actually what um, I asked you to do on the homework exercise for that section. And now you're just going to do it for some passages that I make up that or uh, I take from reading or that sort of thing. So remember, when you put an argument in standard form, you list the premises, you number them, you draw a line, you write the conclusion. So when you get a, when you get a, a passage like this, the first thing you want to do is actually find the conclusion. So here's the passage. The problems we face are large-scale structural problems, often global in scale. Therefore, we need an additional model of responsibility because the liability model only works on a small scale. So what you want to do is look for the indicator words that tell you where the, what is a premise and what is a conclusion. In this case, the word therefore is a conclusion indicator. Here, I'll copy that down here. Um, and because is a premise indicator. So actually what you're looking at here is a situation where uh, you've uh, got the conclusion in the middle of the passage. When we write arguments in standard form, we always write the conclusion at the end, but in ordinary English, the conclusion can occur in any location, uh, the beginning, the end, the middle. Actually, often a very strong way to write is to repeat your conclusion at both the beginning and the end. Putting the conclusion in the middle is actually a weak way to write, but people wind up doing that all the time, so you have to be on the lookout for it. Um, so this is going to be conclusion. We need an additional model of responsibility. And then the other two sentences are premises. Um, the problems we face are structural, often global in scale, um, and P2. Um, the liability model only works on a small scale. I'm cutting and pasting here. You are welcome to cut and paste. Uh, you can also type things out and paraphrase and shorten them if you want to do that. The important thing is that every element of the argument has to be a complete sentence. It has to be a statement that can be true or false because that's what arguments are composed of. All right. So um, that's th those are the two questions on argument. I'm going to have one question from Aristotle. Um, and this one, uh, the one in the practice test is about distributive justice and re re retributive or rectifying justice. 
and it just asks you to identify the difference between them. There are all sorts of different ways I can ask this kind of question. I can ask you to sort examples, for instance, or um, I can ask you to um, decide whether a specific example is uh, distributive or retributive or explain aspects of it. I could do this as a short answer question. Uh, in any case, all of the questions on um, Aristotelian notions of justice were, uh, all the terms for Aristotelian notions of justice were discussed in the um, video right after the justice exercise. So if you remember, I had you um, uh, do an exercise where you just listed words that you associated with the word justice. And then I spent some time sorting those into different categories to show you how patterns could emerge. And one of the most basic patterns that emerged was the difference between uh, distributive and rectifying justice. So let's go over here. This is the chart. Um, and basically the four terms in this section are the terms that are on this chart. So rectifying justice is things like, consists of things like criminal justice. It is justice involved in restoring order to society after something has gone wrong. So when people, if your associations with justice are like the justice system and judges and courts and lawyers and cops, that's all about rectifying justice. Distributive justice was justice in the ordinary workings of society. Both of these are examples of what we call justice in context. Um, and then the other idea that I want you to know about here is the contrast between justice and context and the formal notion of justice. I think it's important to understand what, in, in the most abstract sense, what justice is. Justice, in its most abstract form, is simply being morally consistent, right? Um, if you've got one set of laws, they should apply to everyone, no matter what race they are or what gender they are, that sort of thing. Um, similar cases should be treated similarly. That's the abstract idea of justice. In a more concrete sense, we have to specify what counts as similar. Um, so when Aristotle developed these divisions, he took it for granted that... Um, a relevant difference that gender or whether you were a slave was a relevant difference, but we don't think that is relevant anymore, um, allegedly. So if two people commit the same crime, their gender is not considered a, a relevant difference and therefore they should, they, they're similar cases, we should treat them similarly, that sort of thing. So those are ideas about justice. And then the last two questions, um, oh yeah, so for this one, distributive justice is about distributing the burdens of benefits um, during the normal functioning of a cooperative system or a society, right? The last two questions are about Hasslanger and Young. So um, one, you're identifying aspects and for the other, uh, you're identifying premises in Hasslinger's argument. So the liability model of responsibility uh, is the notion of individual responsibility, right? This goes with ordinary criminal court. If I hurt someone, I'm held responsible for it. So the liability model is backward looking. Um, it seeks to put blame on some and absolve others. Um, it's not a part of distributive justice. It's a part of rectifying justice. Um, and uh, both models of responsibility are needed. Okay. The last essay we read was by Sally Hasslinger, and she wanted to talk, and she said that in fighting against things like racism and sexism, we need to pay attention not just to implicit bias, but to structural injustice, and we talked about what those terms are. Um, and she had reasons for this. So some of her reasons, individual racist and sexist attitudes are not necessary for racism and sexism to exist. 
um, the wrongness of racism and sexism um, comes from the unjust distribution of burdens and benefits. It's a question of what we're calling distributive justice, not from the bad attitudes of individuals. So it's not about punishing individuals for bad attitudes. It's about fixing structural wrongs. Um, and also, um, simply punishing people for bad attitudes doesn't correct the structural wrongs. It just creates resentment amongst the people that you are correcting. Okay, so <clears throat> um, you can submit the practice test all you want, and it's going to give you an auto grade that uh, should only cover the questions that um, uh, don't require direct grading. So in this one, there were two essay questions that will require me to grade them. Oh, and hey, it looks like I lost five points here because of this one. And that, that is a mistake in how I programmed this test. So I need to fix that. Oh, and shoot, I also lost points here because I said rent is basically the same in the city wherever you go. But really, it's a little bit higher in the high income neighborhoods. Um, in this case, what I programmed in was correct. And what I said while making this video is incorrect. Um, so I even screwed up a little bit on the practice test. This would have been a 95. Oh, actually, it would have been more than that because um, I'm giving myself credit for one of the questions that... Uh, was graded improperly by the machine. I will fix that before I publish this. All right. So that's what you need to know about the review sheet and the practice test. And um, uh, once I publish the, the real test, you can take it at any time you want. It's open book and open note. And um, once you open it, you'll have an hour to finish it. And if you have any technical problems with the test, or if you encounter another problem like the one I just saw here that was where the machine had the wrong answer um, plugged into it, just shoot me an email and we'll, we'll work that out.